This video is brought to you by me. For $1 a month, you can support the channel directly and help me keep doing what I love. Thanks for watching and supporting. The Pink Puffball, the eater of dimensions, Majin Buu's cooler older brother. No matter what you know him by, Kirby, the 8-inch tall spear of serotonin, has been around for a long time and has appeared in more games than years have passed since his debut. Since arriving on the scene in 1992, Kirby has become a gaming staple, and with his first foray into 3D with Forgotten Land, I wanted to play some Kirby games. But since I have about negative $12 in my bank account, some old, accessible games will have to do. And as I like to do on this channel, I wanted to start at the very beginning of the series and work my way forward through all three mainline Dreamland games and the main releases in between for a total of five games. So without putting it off any longer, let's just dive into the first Kirby game ever, Kirby's Dreamland for Game Boy. At HAL Laboratory, a 19-year-old Masahiro Sakurai wanted to make a game that was easy to pick up and be fun for a wide range of audiences. As this game took shape and testing began, a round placeholder sprite was inserted into the game until a finalized design would be implemented. However, within HAL, the placeholder became so beloved they decided to keep him. And thus, Kirby was born. As a Game Boy game, the world of Dreamland was a bit drab as the console could only output a few shades of grey or green, depending, and the monochrome color of the game led to confusion about how Kirby was marketed. Sakurai said he always intended Kirby to be pink, but Shigeru Miyamoto initially thought Kirby was supposed to be yellow. Further confusion led to Kirby being depicted as a white blob on the box art, since that's how he appears in the game. In his debut adventure, Kirby sets forth into Dreamland where he is faced with enemies who hold a variety of special powers. In Dreamland, Kirby has no way of accessing these abilities because copy abilities are not here, which initially feels weird because of how ubiquitous Kirby is with swallowing enemies for powers. You can only spit foes in your path as projectiles and obstacles in your way. Because of this, it feels like the most different of all the games I played. It felt, understandably, the simplest of all of them. But more than anything, I think the way it was developed also limited the scope of the game as well. Instead of using a computer to develop the game, Sakurai developed Kirby's Dreamland on a twin Famicom, which was an all-in-one Famicom plus a Famicom disc system. There was no keyboard input on the device, and instead a trackball was used in conjunction with an on-screen keyboard for coding. As someone who just finished a computer science course, that sounds like trying to relocate a mountain using a plastic spoon to dig. However, at the time, Sakurai just kind of assumed that's how games were made. He also said this limited way of programming helped the game retain focus and made the character movements very smooth in the final product. Kirby's Dreamland feels like it was developed in this way, and that it feels very Kirby 1.0. As a game that came out just a few years into the Game Boy's life cycle, the 512 kilobit constraint made the game feel small. Even leisurely, the game takes about 45 minutes to beat from start to finish. It's a pretty simple game, but without copy abilities, it mildly changed the strategy for taking down bosses and enemies. Instead of wailing on them and tanking damage, you had to use the projectiles given to you when the bosses happened to drop them. What I did find really interesting about the game was how much of the Kirby personality was here from the very beginning. There were plenty of Waddle Dees and Doos running around, you fight Wispy Woods here and set Kirby's deforestation goals in motion, and you fight King Dedede as a final boss. While the first entry has been remade a few times, I thought it was important to take a look back on where the series first originated. It's not as impressive as it once was, but for what it was I had a good time with it. I'm just glad I played it first or else I would have been likely pretty disappointed by its simplicity. It's a good game, but its length and primitive nature holds it back from standing up as a great Kirby game. A year after Kirby's Dreamland came out, Kirby's Adventure was released on the NES. Instead of porting the first game to home console as was initially pitched, Sakurai and his team decided to create a whole new game that would appeal to the more hardcore audience of the NES as opposed to the casual audience on the Game Boy. The move to console opened a lot of new power that could be used to improve the formula and add a bit more challenge to the games for those who thought Dreamland was too easy. This game added movement features like the slide kick and the run. Inhaling more than one enemy 
need a time allowed Kirby to shoot a penetrative projectile that would kill enemies or obstacles in his way and continue moving after making impact. But the biggest addition to the game was Kirby's copy ability. The team prototyped and conceptualized 40 different abilities Kirby would be able to use, and a total of 24 of those made it into the final game. This allowed the game to stay fresh as players could test out and try new powers. And in Kirby's adventure, our pink hero needs all the help he can get. An evil presence named Nightmare arrives in Dreamland and causes the residents of the land to have bad dreams. Additionally, King Dedede has stolen and broken up Dreamland's only defense against this otherworldly being, the star rod that powers the dream spring and provides the area with good vibes. In order to fight off Nightmare, Kirby must reassemble the Star Rod and fight Nightmare in space in a genre-bending final challenge. The levels in Kirby's Adventure are broken up by a hub world so that the players can return to earlier levels to redo them if desired. This also introduces the possibility for new diversions in between levels as well. Kirby's Adventure introduces a few interesting mini-games that reward the player with extra lives and health. Take for instance the claw machine that is almost as difficult as a real claw machine, where the user has to pick up and win a large fully inhaled Kirby. These small games were a fun diversion and helped break up the game. Adventure blew Dreamland 1 out of the water, and I had a great time with it. Seeing Kirby and his friends in full color really brought the game to life and added so much vibrancy and eye candy to the artwork. Dreamland created the Kirby atmosphere, Adventure really tuned and refined it into a cute, accessible world. It also feels far more fleshed out and took me a few hours to beat. It's much more game to enjoy. After Kirby's sole mainline adventure on console, he returned to Game Boy in Dreamland 2. This time around, another evil entity named Dark Matter has arrived in Dreamland with the goal of conquering it. He steals all the bridges that connect the seven Rainbow Islands, and Kirby must fight to the end to restore them. This is the first mainline game in the series to feature a true ending and a false ending. I got the bad one. Each island contains a rainbow drop hidden away, and to reach the true ending, Kirby must regain all of these drops from the islands in order to power a rainbow sword and face dark matter in a boss fight. You have to get all the drops to get the true ending, and I did not realize that. Instead of an epic final battle, Kirby and his friends walk home in the rain, sadly looking up at the sky, defeated and disappointed. This made me feel like trash. Luckily, Returning from Adventure is a hub world where Kirby can revisit previously finished levels in order to scrape through them again and find the missing rainbow drops. Continuing the trend of gameplay additions, Kirby's Dreamland 2 features brand new animal friends Kirby can recruit to help him conquer dark matter. There are three different animals in total, a hamster named Rick, an owl named Koo, and a fish named Kine. Each of the animals enable moves Kirby is unable to access otherwise. Rick is fast and has traction on ice. Koo allows Kirby to inhale enemies while flying through the air and can fly through heavy winds that Kirby couldn't surpass himself. Kine lets Kirby inhale enemies underwater and can swim faster against strong currents with the trade-off of being slower on land. Dreamland 2 was also the first handheld game that let players bring copy abilities on the go. While on paper it seems like much fewer copy abilities than Adventure allowed with only 7, each has multiple variants that depend on which animal is helping Kirby. So while Kirby alone can only access 7 abilities, each of them have 3 different forms when used with an animal bringing the unofficial number to 28. I really enjoyed Dreamland 2. I would say that with the addition of a true ending, it encourages players to explore and return to levels they didn't get the rainbow drops on. The animals change how well the players can approach different challenges as well. It was a fun, pleasant experience throughout. Kirby Superstar freaking rules. After years of misunderstanding what this game was, my eyes have been open to the good news of Milky Way wishes. Ambitions were big for Kirby's debut on the SNES, and one of the major additions Sakurai was eyeing was cooperative gameplay, which came with stronger enemies and combos to offset how easy the game would have been with two players. 
Whether playing alone or with a friend, at the touch of a button, Kirby can transfer his copy ability into a helper that is either AI controlled or player controlled and allows the player to travel through levels with a companion. There are plenty of unique copy abilities in Superstar with new ones joining in the fray. My favorite of all was the Earthbound inspired yo-yo ability where Kirby beat up on enemies with a toy, but there were plenty of other awesome abilities added here. However, Superstar isn't just one game, it is many games in one. While the 8-in-1 promise feels like a little bit of a stretch, there is a lot of amazing stuff in this single release. Let's start with the minigames before we work our way into the meat of the game. Gourmet Race is a side-scrolling sprint where you as Kirby race to eat as much as possible and beat King DDD to the finish line. It's simple and fun for a while, but after you beat it, I'm not sure how much staying power it has. Megaton Punch and Samurai Kirby are reflexive games where you time button presses to beat opponents at skill games. Megaton Punch is my favorite of the two because you can split Kirby's home planet of Planet Popstar in half. There are also a few new bonus modes unlocked for progressing through the games, like the Arena, which is a boss rush mode where you have one life to beat all the bosses in the entirety of Kirby Superstar while using whatever copy abilities you want. Spring Breeze is an abridged remake of the original Kirby game for Game Boy, and it's great. Copy abilities are now present, and levels are combined to make it a more seamless experience at the expense of a few boss fights getting cut out. It's fun for newcomers and people who have played the original game alike because it's familiar enough to please those who played the first game while adding more content while also being a fun game to play for someone who hadn't played it before. Revenge of Meta Knight is a fun, time-based entry where you have to complete levels as quickly as possible before time expires and prevent Meta Knight from invading Dreamland. This mode adds urgency and the reliance on running through levels, and as you finish them, Meta Knight's warship, the Halberd, takes damage until you destroy it entirely. Dynablade is a brief four-level mode where Kirby tries to stop a bird from destroying Dreamland's crops that culminates in this fun boss fight. Were you expecting a Metroidvania in Kirby Superstar? Because there is one. The Great Cave Offensive has Kirby exploring different areas to solve puzzles and discover treasure while fighting boss battles in his way. As you discover treasure, you find nods to other Nintendo games like the Triforce, a Mr. Saturn, and plenty of other cool items from Nintendo's history. The final main mode of the game is Milky Way Wishes, which is basically an entire Kirby game within this series of Kirby games. The sun and the moon are fighting and threatening the safety of the galaxy, and Kirby sets off to find the pieces of a comet clock named Nova in order to restore it and have a wish granted. The big twist in this game mode is that Kirby does not collect copy abilities in the traditional way of inhaling foes. Rather, he must explore levels and find the statues of the different abilities in order to collect them. On the positive side of this, all the abilities Kirby collects are permanently added to his repertoire and can be equipped on demand at any time. It's a really interesting trade-off and I thought it was really cool to be able to find and equip all my favorite abilities whenever I wanted. It added a fun twist to the Kirby experience. While I don't want to say all the different game modes were over saying they're welcome, I appreciate the fact that each of them had their own little trademark twists on what Kirby games could be. I liked how experimental the developers got with it as they tested the waters for different things the character would get into. Kirby Superstar is a bunch of content that just keeps on giving to the player and rewards them with even more modes for conquering the different games on offer. My main excitement came from seeing what each new mode's twist had in store for me, and it got me excited for what was to come with Kirby games down the road that I have missed out on. I had my hopes high for Dreamland 3 after how much I loved Kirby Superstar, which was probably a mistake. This wasn't a sequel to Superstar, it was a sequel to the Game Boy game Kirby's Dreamland 2 that we already talked about. Unfortunately for me, that meant my experience was a bit mixed. Now don't get me wrong, there's still a lot to like here. First let's talk about the story. A dark cloud appears over Dreamland and infects all of Kirby's friends with an evil essence. Kirby must save the day again, only this time the story continues on from this into the N64 release, Kirby 64 The Crystal Shards, a game I will probably look at later since I grew up on this one and I think it deserves its own video. I really liked how the story brought back the grimness of Dreamland 2 by showing a contrasting darkness invading the bubblegum and sugar Dreamland. This time around, I loved how the game looked. To me, it's the best looking game of all five I played for this video, and it reminds me somewhat of the look of Yoshi's Island for the SNES. 
It has a more handmade look to it compared to the straight pixel art from the other releases, and I think it looks absolutely fantastic. The way the foreground and the background are shaded adds depth to the levels, and the way Kirby was drawn makes him really look like a sphere. This game also introduces another three animal companions to the mix, bringing the total to six. New to the game are Nago the Cat, Pitch the Bird, and Choo Choo the Octopus. Similarly to how they worked in Dreamland 2, they expand copy abilities in the game as Kirby teams up with them. But with that comes fewer copy abilities. There are only nine main abilities in this game, and it feels so scaled back compared to the sheer variety of them in Superstar. But to me, where I feel like the game truly let me down was the level design. For every good level I genuinely really like, there was one I didn't particularly care for, whether it be too generic or uninspired. It really prevented me from building momentum in the fun I was having. Half of the levels just felt uninteresting to the other half that was a blast. As a follow-up to how many fun experiences were created in Superstar, Dreamland 3 just felt like a step backward for the series. As a sequel to Dreamland 2, it feels exactly like how you'd expect it to. But following such an experimental game, it just feels like this release rests on its laurels. While I know some people really like it, to me it just feels like it's too much paint by numbers in terms of what it lifts from other platformers of the time. Dreamland 3 fails to establish its own personality outside of the art style. If you like classic Kirby, you'll like Dreamland 3, but don't expect it to push the series forward in new and interesting ways. Well that was a quick 5 games, wasn't it? Blasting through a bunch of Kirby games was a fun time for me because I had never played these games in order of release, and with how long Kirby has been around, I thought it was a shame that I hadn't. I don't love ranking games because ranking things 1-5 to five makes it seem like anything lower than 2 or 3 isn't worth playing, but with Kirby that just isn't the case. There is not a bad game in the bunch, it's just that some of the games are more good than others. So when I show how I'd rank the games, take it with a grain of salt. The difference between 1 and 5 is not drastic. Coming in at number 5 is Kirby's Dream Land. While this game has to be respected for introducing us to the iconic character, it's a bit too simple by today's standards and lacks a lot of the staple abilities you can look for in every other Kirby game. But clocking in at less than an hour of playtime, it's far from a slog. At number 4 I have Kirby's Dream Land 3. The game's art style looks great, and the new animals add a fun twist to the gameplay, but overall the level design left a lot to be desired. Still, it's an enjoyable enough game that's worth playing. Number 3 really could have gone one of two ways, but I think the spot goes to Kirby's Adventure. This game introduces a lot of quality of life improvements like running and slide kicking, but it also added the iconic copy abilities. With 24 different abilities to play with and experiment with, the game will keep you entertained for a while, and I was surprised at how well it held up. Number 2 just barely edges out adventure for this spot. Dreamland 2 narrowed down the copy abilities, but it introduced the animal companions that help Kirby. I think the addition of a true ending and the ability to travel off the beaten path to discover the rainbow drops has enough replayability to keep coming back to. Lastly, to no one's surprise, is Kirby Superstar which almost hardly feels fair, since it technically includes the 5th ranked game on this list. Still, it is a single release, so I am counting it as one game. Truly, there is so much here to like that it's hard to just focus on one thing, but with how much it iterates and tests the limits of what Kirby can do, makes it fun and exciting to play. I feel like my time with Superstar is just beginning, and that makes me really happy. So what is your favorite Kirby game? Let me know in the comments down below and tell me what Kirby game I need to play next. If you like the video, leave a like on it, and subscribe if you want to see more videos like this. Lastly, if you want to support the channel directly, head on over to my Patreon link in the description. For $1 a month, you can get early access to all my videos and some content you can't get anywhere else. I'd like to take a minute and thank my higher tier patrons, Andrew Lang, Andrew Elmore, Andrew Donahoe, Just Jessica, Okayla, and 8 Jesus. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.